All right, so we are continuing our discussion on finite state machine design. Uh, the daily quiz for today is quiz number 23 that is available throughout the day. Please go to Gradescope to answer these four simple questions. Um, I'm glad that you, uh, you, know, you guys uh, have uh, increased the participation as far as daily quiz is concerned. So that's good to see, keep that up. We have uh, one more week of classes left. So Friday of next week will be our last class for the semester. All right, happy Friday. Today is April 23rd. Uh, the last homework that is due, I know Bennett. The last homework that is due, that's homework 12, is due, well, I'm, I changed this actually. Uh, it's actually due Friday. So Friday, April 30th. Um, because I, I, I assigned a few uh, questions from memory, uh, we may or may not be uh, able to get to that today. So let's see. Uh, but it's due um, the last class day, Friday, April 30th. Uh, no next homework. In terms of studio, you only have studio eight that's left. So that's due the last Wednesday of the semester, April 28th. Uh, no studio nine. Now, as you are getting close to the end of the semester, I want to emphasize how important it is for you to verify your grades on Gradescope. So each and every student, uh, please go to Gradescope and check your submissions and the grades that you got for your submissions. This includes studios, homework, exams, all of, the, all of those things should be in place. Uh, I don't want you guys to be waiting for uh, a finals week to do that check. Right, so I want you guys to uh, do a thorough check of your grades, whether you were added to the submission or not, um, whether you got uh, the right score or not. Like, I want you guys to go and check uh, that. Uh, don't leave it to the last minute. Okay, let's see. The, the first finite state machine design that we will look at uh, today is finite string recognizer so i'm going to uh, you know have a problem here where we will try to detect a certain bit pattern and we will respond to it uh, differently for different series of inputs but for this fsm we only have one input on which we are observing the input bits coming in but those input bits are being um, detected or looked at one at a time. So it's a one bit input X and there's one output Z that is essentially going to be our detection or recognition output. And the description of this finite state machine is that I want the output to be asserted. Z should be one if the three previous input bits are zero, one, zero. Uh, Bennett says, would the combination lock be like this? Uh, so not really. We will also look at uh, examples about combination lock uh, later on in today's lecture. Uh, we'll take a look at a you know rather simple one and then we will uh, enhance its functionality. So stay tuned for that. But this is this one is essentially for string detection, a series of bits being detected. Right, so a bit pattern detection. So z output Z should be asserted if the three, the previous three inputs were to be 0, 1, 0. And where are they going to be observed? Well, that is coming from our input X. So Z becomes a one when X, the last three inputs were 0, 1, 0. And we are gonna respond to another bit pattern, which is one, zero, zero. So Z can be one, if the last three bits are zero, one, zero, and one, zero, zero has never been seen. So if the input C is one, zero, zero, then it will never be asserted, right? So zero, detect one, zero, one, zero, as long as one, zero, zero has never been seen. What this means is that my state transition diagram has to have the ability to monitor these three previous inputs, zero, one, zero. And I also need to keep track of one, zero, zero, right? So this is not just detection of one string, 
one bit pattern, I'm actually looking for two bit patterns and I'm responding to them differently. Now, what are some assumptions that we can make over here? As usual, and this applies for a very generic conversation about FSM design, you will have a reset uh, input that will put the FSM in the reset state. Output Z is asserted after the bit is seen, after the last input bit on input X is seen, which means that I want this particular finite state machine to be a Moore machine. So it is changing when the output of the flip-flop changes. So those are certain assumptions that I have made. And as we go through, we will see if we need to make more assumptions. But the key point here is this. We are going to design our finite state machine such that we are going to uh, be tracking the, these two uh, sequences, last three to be 010 zero, zero, and the last three to be 100. Zero, zero. Now, if you want to talk about this finite state machine in a little bit more detail, we can do that by talking about its behavior. So how does it supposed to behave? How is it supposed to behave? So on input X, we have some arbitrary input bits coming in, right? These are just arbitrarily chosen, some input bit stream on X. So it is right now arbitrarily chosen to be 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. And to, to explain what this FSM is supposed to do for this particularly arbitrarily chosen X, let us see what, what Z is going to be, or it should be. Well, Z is going to respond to one, sorry, zero, one, zero, as long as one, zero, zero has never been seen. The last three have never been zero, one, zero, zero. So we'll start with this, right? When you look at the first zero, well, it should not be recognized. So Z is, uh, don't care at that point, right? You have not determined uh, Z at that point. It is only going to change after there is an active edge on the clock and then the flip-flops go to the next uh, state. So that is going to be zero over here. So this particular zero here is making that zero over there. And then we are going to continue that. So after this zero, zero. After this zero, still zero. But after this one, now we are looking at the last three input bits and it looks like it is zero, zero, one not to be detected. So we'll keep our uh, input 0, 0, we'll keep our output at 0. However, once the next 0 comes in, now the last three input bits are 0, 1 and 0 and our output is now asserted. Remember, we have never seen 1, 0, 0 so that's fine. That's, that's exactly why we are asserting the output in this case. And then once we do that, we are going to move on to the next time step. In the next time step, uh, we have a one coming in. If you have a one coming in, then the last three are what? One, zero, one, output not asserted. At this point, after the next zero comes in, zero, one, zero, that's supposed to be detected, output gets asserted. Next input one, breaks the pattern, output becomes zero. Next zero, detects 0, 1, 0, output becomes a 1. But after the next 0, you see what happens? The last three inputs are now 1, 0, 0 now. So after this point, the output can never be 1 after that, no matter what comes in on your input. All right. So that is just to explain you the serial behavior or intended behavior for this finite state machine. Now, I'll uh, walk you guys through uh, through all the steps that are involved. Uh, where is my mouse here? Okay, I, I'm going to walk you through all the steps that are involved. Um, but I will try to do this in a in a in a sort of um, you know from beginning from scratch. So I'm going to add a page here, and I'm going to start with my state zero, which is sort of my reset or initializing state, right? So what I'll do is I will draw a sort of a black circle over here and I will say if I reset, I will come over here. That's the first step I'm going to do while I sketch the state transition diagram. And I'm going to call this guy 
say S0. And because I am doing a, I am designing a Moore finite state machine, my output is going to be directly associated with the state, which means that output is going to get listed inside the circle. And if you are in the reset state, obviously your output should be a zero. Now from state zero, I can have two possibilities happen, right? Um, but what am I trying to look for? I'm trying to look for the string 010. And I'm also trying to look for the string 100 because I'm responding to them slightly differently, but I still need to detect both those strings. So what I'll have is I'll have sort of a uh, two paths for uh, this state machine. In one, I will go left and that doesn't really matter if you go left or right, but I'm, I'm gonna go left and have three states over here. To detect the string zero, one and zero. So if I get a zero, I will go there. If I get a one after that, I will go there. And if I get a zero, I will go over there. Right. So this is zero, one and zero. That's sort of my goal, right? That's my initial, uh, uh, that's what I'm trying to detect. So it's, that's sort of the good path for detec detection. So next I'm going to call these guys S1, S2 and S3. What are the outputs going to be? Well, the outputs are going to be zero over here. Don't assert it over here. But if you are in S3, you are going to assert that output one. So that's sort of your one path. The second path is going to be very similar because it is still tracking three bits. And I'm going to lay it out over here. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. That didn't really work well. Okay, fine. Okay, and then I will go here, here, and here. When I get in blue, let's say one, zero, and zero, right? So I'm, I'm laying out for each of these sequences that I want to detect. I have one path for the 0, 1, 0 cycle and I have the other path for the 1, 0, 0 cycle, uh, a pattern. And now I can call these guys, uh, I went from S3, so I, I can, this can be S4, this can be S5, this can be S6. And all these three, obviously, my output should not be asserted. So I'm going to make my output zero for all those cases. So. I hope that from the problem statement up to this point, things are pretty straightforward, right? Because they are directly, uh, the, the state diagram so far until now, it is direct result of the three bits that were supposed to be detected. Uh, can you be in two states at the same time? Can't be. What if you get a zero while in S3? That's exactly what we are going to need to draw right because from each state there can be two possibilities you can get the next input bit to be a zero or you can get a one next so we have partially drawn the state diagram so far we have to complete it so only a few things are, have been mentioned so far so let's go through it s0 do i have two arrows going out absolutely i know what to do when i get a zero and I know what to do when I get a one. Now from S1, let's take a look. If you are in S1, which means that the last input was a zero, what should you do if you get a zero? Uh, so you see, you cannot reset, right? Because the next zero that you get might be the start of the next zero one zero sequence. 
You guys see that? So you, you got to self loop on S1 in that case. So what I'm going to do is if I get a zero here, I'm going to self loop because that might be the start of the next zero one zero cycle, which I need to detect. So I need to sort of uh, capture that newest input of zero in my zero one zero pattern. Next, uh, from S1, I have both arrows, zero and one. Let's go to S2. So what does S2 mean? S2 means that the last two inputs were uh, zero followed by a one, right? So if you are, you have a zero, then you have a one, you go to S2, you know what to do when the next input bit is a zero, but what should you do if you get a one? Andrew has already answered the question. Yes, go to S4. And the reason why you would go to S4 is because that might be the start of the 100 pattern. So you, are, you guys are absolutely right. If I get a one here, I am going to jump over there. Okay, so S2 is done. What about S3? S3, I do not know what to do if I get a one and I do not know what I need to do to uh, if I get a zero. So from S3, you've already got the last three input bits as zero, one and zero. What should you do if you get a one? What should you do if you get a one from S3? Go to S2, right? Go to S2 because the last two bits, you see, zero followed by a one, right? So I need to keep that zero there. So because I need to capture this last zero from S3, if I get a one, uh, come on, I'm going to jump back to S2. You guys see that? Because it could be zero, one, and then back to zero again, and you will be in S3 asserting the output. All right, from S3, if you get a zero, from S3, if you get a zero, where should you go? By the way, if you get a zero from S3, that essentially means that you have now gotten one followed by a zero followed by another zero, which means you go to S6, that's right. Okay, so you go to S6 in that case. Okay, so we are done with the uh, arrows on the left hand, left side. Let's focus on the right side now. You are in S4. If you are in S4, you know what to do if you get a zero. If you get a zero, go to S5. But what should you do if you get a one from S4? Self loop, that's right. You're going to do a self loop because another one could be the start of the one zero zero pattern. It will not be zero one zero, right? Because you need a zero for that. That's not going to happen because one followed by another one, you will stay in S4. So let me draw a self loop back to S4 for a one. All right, S4 is done, S5. If you, from S5, you know what to do when you get a zero, what, where do you go if you get a one? From S5, go to S2, that's right. Because S2, S5 means, the last two inputs were one and a zero. And if you get a one, that essentially means it could be part of the zero one zero pattern. So you go to the other side. Remember, if you are in S5, you have still not detected one zero zero, right? So it, there is a way for you to go back to the zero one zero pattern uh, path. All right, so I'm gonna go back to S2 in that case, if I get a one. Okay, S5 is done. I think the last thing that is left is S6. What should I do if you are in S6? Infinite self loop for both variables. That's right. So if you if you are in S6, that means you have already detected 100. No matter what you get from here, 0 or 1, you will keep doing a self loop. For both 0 and 1, you will just do a self loop there. And that's it, right? That's your finite state machine uh, sorry, 
the state transition diagram. What do you do from the state transition diagram? You guys remember? You, you already, okay, so let me, let me do it this way. Questions about how we drew the state transition diagram. That's right, we'll go to the state transition table. Uh, which one, symbolic or encoded? If hypothetically speaking, S6 didn't end, we would go to S2. If S6 didn't end, uh, that if S6, what is S6? S6 is the last three bits were one, zero and zero, right? Uh, and if you did not end it there, then you, you would go to S, S1 if you get a zero and you would go to S2 if you got a one. Uh, with a one, you would go to S2. That's right. But with a zero, you would go to S1. That's hypothetically speaking, right? Yeah, because our problem statement is uh, ending it at S6. Okay, questions about the state diagram? Okay, so I suppose we can talk about what comes next. Uh, let's see, I'm going to add a page here, current template, sure, and talk about what comes next. After the state diagram comes what? Um, you get a symbolic state transition table. What are the columns going to be in the symbolic state transition table? The columns are going to be present state input x, next state, uh, and then depending on whether you're using toggle flip flop or D flip flop and whatnot, you might get, uh, you know, uh, T's or JK's. If it is D, then your next state is your input to the D flip flop. In that case, you don't have to have additional columns. Uh, and then the, uh, the last one is going to be output Z. But in this, you're going to be using S0, S1, S2, and S3, and so on. Um, what if we skip the symbolic and went straight to binary? Sure, you can do that as long as we do this step. We explicitly say, uh, uh, we explicitly do the state encoding first. You can do that. So if you are able to do the state encoding first, then you can directly write the encoded state transition table. Sure. Uh, what could be a, an example of state encoding? Well, we have, uh, how many states did we have? S0 through S7, right? So we had seven states. Uh, so you would map S0, S1, blah, 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 to S7. Uh, how many bits do you need? You obviously need three bits for this, three, absolutely right. So you could do this, for example. Uh, for seven, oh no, just six. Six is the last one. Uh, for six, you might have uh, one zero zero, right? So if you do the state encoding, then you can do the um, encoded, encoded state transition table. Now, when you are doing this, and that's what I did on the homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, absolutely good. Um, when you're writing up the state encoded state transition table, your columns are going to slightly get changed, right? Instead of um, present state being one column, now your present state is going to have Q2, Q1, Q0, right? The current outputs of the three flip-flops. And obviously we need three flip-flops, right? Three flip-flops for this because we have seven states. So that would be our present state column, followed by, you will get input X, then you will get uh, Q2 plus and Q1 plus and Q0 plus. And depending on what, what flip-flop I'm using, I may be able to directly say this is D2, D1, D0, or if I was using other types of flip-flops, then I might need T2, T1, T0, or 
J2K2, J1K1, and J0K0, right? A lot more columns in that case. Um, but I suppose you guys uh, get that. And I, I can I can say this is my next state, and then my output Z, right? That's my output Z. So that will complete the state, uh, sorry, encoded state transition table. From encoded state transition table, what are you trying to derive? The co columns never end, yeah. <laughs> right. After that, what is the step next? After encoded state transition table, what step are we doing? As, oh, by the way, how many rows are there in this? Number of rows in this state encoded state transition table, how many rows are you gonna get? Number of rows in this. So right now the number of columns are three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight if you were using uh, D flip-flops. But if you were using some like T flip-flops, you might have uh, plus three. 14, 14 rows is absolutely right. So you have got 14 because from each starting state, you have two input situations to cover. Seven times two, that's right. Seven states. For each state, you can have an input of zero or one. So you've got 14 rows there. So it's a pretty big table. All right, uh, we have talked about that. Now let's see. After the state uh, encoded state transition table, what's your next step? K map. How many K maps and what is the size? Number of K maps. And the size. Size of each K map. Uh, what is that? One four by four. Uh, that's it. How many? What is this? Okay, so forget about the size. How many K maps are you gonna have? Three. All right, you guys still are not doing Z. All right, four, four, four. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> If numbers had capitalization, I think you guys were yelling at. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Number of K maps are going to be four. Q2 plus, Q1 plus, Q0 plus, Z. In terms of X2, X1, X0, and input X. Right? So those are going to be your four uh, K maps. E size of each K map, four variable K map. Right? So the first one you're doing this for Q2 plus, Q1 plus, Q0 plus, that would give you essentially, you know, D2, D1, D0, right? The inputs to the D flip-flops. And then you are, you all also have Z in there. So you will you'll have four, four variable K maps. So when you're, what, det what determines the size of each K map? Well, the number of inputs to the K map. It's going to be Q2, Q1, Q0, and X, right? So you're essentially writing logic expressions for D2, D1, D0, Z in terms of Q2, Q1, Q0, X. What would be the last step? After you get those expressions, what would be, what would be the last step in this process? Imagine if you spam build the circuit all right so build fsm uh we are gonna have three flip-flops right you're gonna have three flip-flops in there in this case d flip-flops and you're gonna have logic gates based on the logic expressions you derived and then you'll also have interconnections and that'll do it right Okay, so that was a quick refresher about the whole design process uh, for, uh, you know, the process is for any really. Uh, no, we are not doing it. This was a refresher. We have actually done that same process uh, a few times. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm not going to go over the slides now. 
just because we have actually derived the entire state diagram from scratch. So, uh, you know, I don't need to do the, the, the slides again. This is going to be redundant. Uh, but that's essentially what we did. Good path, another good path. Both I need to detect. One for 010, one zero, the other one for 100. Zero zero. And then the slide talks about how do you add on all the other input combinations. We have already done this. And at the end, once you do all of that, you end up with that state diagram. Uh, and this is exactly what we uh, had earlier. On to the next finite state machine. This is going to be a traffic light controller. Uh, before I take this on, uh, are there any questions about the the whole finite string recognizer FSM? coming up with the state diagram and all the other steps that we listed. Okay. Let's take a look at a f uh, what is the fourth K map? Uh, fourth K map is for Z. Mm, yeah. Traffic light controller. Uh, we have a busy highway and that is intersected by a little used farm road. So highway is sort of getting a higher priority than, uh, uh, you know, frequent, uh, sorry, uh, not so frequently used farm road. There are detectors called C that are sensing the presence of cars that are waiting on the farm road. Oh, uh, no, it's not a priority encoder. Uh, we are just going to have, so the way we are assigning priority to the highway is we are essentially using a timer that is a long timer uh, as opposed to a short timer expiring. Um, that, that, so that the time for which cars can be going on the highway is longer. That's the only way we are giving it priority. Um, and there are also some other... <laughs> Uh, and, and there are also certain other uh, statements that are going to assign a little bit more priority in, in the sense of priority. We'll talk about that. So they are detectors, but only on the farm road that are going to tell us whether there are any cars waiting or not. With no car on the farm road, the lights remain green in the highway direction. So cars can be moving on the highway direction. It's going to be a green on the highway if there are no cars waiting on the farm road if the vehicle is on the farm road that means that we are detecting it highway lights will go from green to yellow to red so there's going to be a transition from the outputs green to yellow to red and after it goes to red this will allow farm road lights to become green so we have many outputs to consider here but we may be able to reuse some of the things we'll talk about that uh, the, the farm road green light will stay on only as long as the farm road car is detected. So only until there is a car, uh, but never longer than a set interval. So we are going to have two things that determine how long can cars go on the farm road. One, you need to be detecting a car, but it that time can never be longer than a set timer. So if the timer expires and there is no car, oh sorry, the timer expires, whether there is car or not, we are going to turn off the green on the farm road. Next, when con conditions are met, farm lights transition from green to yellow to red, uh, to red, allowing highway to return to green. This is why traffic happens when you get random influx of farm road cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, even if farm road, uh, even if there are vehicles or cars that are on the farm road that are waiting, the highway will get at least a set interval as green. So there are going to be two timers 
for which you are going to keep the highway lights on green on and for farm road uh, lights to be green right so two two intervals here let me highlight those one set interval here and the other set interval for the highway timer zero timer one sure uh, i think i have a long timer and short timer uh, but we we will take a look uh so this is sort of a description of or a diagram showing you what the problem is you've got this highway here you've got a farm road at that intersection and their detection uh, uh, there is detection being performed for the carts that are that could be waiting on the farm road uh, and we are sort of giving priority to the highway uh, and not the farm road in this case and there are some some lights uh, to tell us uh, which light uh, you know highway three lights farm road three lights so these are farm low uh, farm road lights and these are highway lights hl and fl now what are the available timers you guys have started talking about that already uh imagine because farm <laughs> guys let the civil engineers worry about that all right so we are just doing the circuitry for the traffic light controller let the civil engineers take that bridge thing up all right what are the available timers well we are going to assume that you, we have a uh, interval timer that generates a short pulse a short timer ts and a long time pulse tl this pulse short time and long time is in response to a start timer signal so whenever you 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 start this timer there is a short pulse that is going to start expiring in uh, the interval timer counting down and there is a long time pulse that is also going to start counting down right but both are in response to the same start timer signal TS, the short time pulse, is being used for timing the yellow lights. So the transition between green to yellow to red, that is going to be based on the, the, the quick time, is based on the short time pulse. Whereas the long timer, long time pulse, is being used for the green lights. So for the amount of time the green lights have to be on, that is being set by TL. The, the short time is essentially for the um the the transitions from green to yellow to red which are supposed yeah, going to be uh, much shorter next we are going to next tabulate all our inputs and outputs we have a reset that is essentially going to place the finite state machine in the initial state as usual we have an input signal called c that is essentially going to be used to detect whether a vehicle is waiting on the farm road or not then we have a short time interval expired signal, TS, which essentially means that in response to the start timer signal, when does the short pulse expire? That is going to be our TS signal. That's an input signal because we are going to respond to that with our lights changing. TL is the long time expired. So this is another timer in which that is essentially controlling the green lights that is a long time interval both ts and tl are responding to the start timer uh, can we make the initial state highway green farm road uh, red uh, sure you can do that but you will have to state that as an assumption so many of these problems um, th there is they are open ended um, and you have that room to state an assumption and then carry out your state diagram. So sure, you can do that. Um, but then you'll have to figure out if you ever wanted to reset the machine, what would be your state, right? So if it's sort of your default state anyway, you can go ahead with that. Now, what are the output signals? Well, highway green, highway yellow, highway red. Those are your three outputs for those three lights. And similarly for the farm, ro farm road lights, green, yellow, and red. So assert the green, yellow, red for highway, assert the green, yellow, red 
for farm road. ST is start timing a short or long interval. That's another output signal. So let's take a look at, so this is the sort of the list of the inputs and outputs that we are considering. Now let's talk about the states, unique states. Again, as I said, some of these states we might be able to reuse, and but now we are only talking about the unique states. Some of these light configurations will imply others. For example, this is going to be very intuitive, right? So if there is a green light on, on the highway, that essentially going to correspond to a farm road light being red. And if there is a yellow on the highway, that means that the farm road is going to be red. And if there is a green on farm road, similarly, highway is supposed to be red. And the farm road is yellow, highway is supposed to be red. So all these are implied if you know these. So we don't need two separate states. We can just accumulate that as one state, as zero. As zero can be the state in which the highway green light is asserted. And at the same time, farm road red light is asserted. So you have got, uh, no, four states, two outputs per state. Mm, actually, right, two outputs per state, but you have to off, you have to switch off all the others, right? So you can say two active outputs per state. All the outputs will, will be there for every state. Some of them will be on, some of them will be off but you can say two active outputs per state. All right, so let's talk about S1. Well, what does S1 mean? That's a state in which a highway yellow for a very short duration is going to be yellow and during which farm road light has to be red and so on. So that's what, how we are coming up with this unique states. Once we have the information about the inputs and the states, next is going to be to sketch out the state transition diagram. But before that, we will list out all the assumptions. And this is important for you guys to do as well. Every time you are designing a finite state machine, I want you guys to take the list of assumptions very seriously and list it out, right? Until you list out, because they are open-ended problems, until you list out the assumptions that went into your finite state machine, they will uh, they, they will not be very easily, uh, easily understood by the, the person who is looking at your design. So uh, sort of make that your practice of listing the assumptions right up front. What happens when you reset? What happens when the start uh, starts the reset is also starting the timer? So these kind of things uh, state them. So the first assumption, reset is going to place the timer in S0. That's when highway is green and farm road is red. So we are already doing the same thing that uh, Andrew has suggested. Let's make this our start state. Reset also starts the timer. So start the timer means now once it's going to control the short time, the short timer and the long timer as well. We are going to stay in S0 as long as no one is on the farm road, no car is detected. C doesn't uh, become one. And even if there is a farm road vehicle that is waiting, the highway will stay in green at least as long as the long time interval. So for a very long time, it's going to be green, even if there is a car waiting on the farm road. There is unstated problem spec that there is, there will never be a bicycle or pedestrian. We are only looking for say cars. We are, our detection mechanism is cars, only, for cars only. Next, let's the, the the state transition diagram has already been done. Let's talk about how uh, how are all these transitions listed. First, because we had four states, we drew four circles: S0, S1, S2, S3. S0 essentially means highway light green is on. That also means farm road is red, and so on. These are these are the same as earlier when we tabulated all the unique states. So that's S0, S1, S2, S3. And what type of finite state machine are we designing here? Huh? 
Why is it more? Mili. Right? Output becomes active as soon as your inputs become active, right? So inputs, uh, the output is not asserted or not asserted. Output doesn't change when you reach the next state. Output is changing as soon as your input changes. So that's a melee machine because it is on the arrow as opposed to the state. Next, reset it, we go to S0 where our default situation is happening where the, the highway uh, green light is on. If you are in S0 and your input is TL and C, which means there is a car waiting on the farm road and the long timer expires. You see that? If the long timer expires and at the same time car is waiting, then you will move from S0 to S1. In S1, the highway light will become yellow only for a short duration of time. And while you are transitioning from S0 to S1, you will have an output that gets asserted, ST. ST is what? It is start of timer. So we are starting both timers, right? So this is sort of a reset for both. ST is resetting both TL, the long timer, and TS, the short timer. Right, so, so we are going from S0 to S, S1. When the long timer expires and there is a car waiting on the farm road, and while we are transitioning from S0 to S1, we are also resetting both the timers because we want them to go back to their initial state and then do the short pulse and or long pulse again. We move to S1, we will stay in S1 as long as the short timer doesn't expire. But if it expires, we will reset both timers again and we will move to S2. You guys see that? Next, if you are in S2, that essentially means that the farm road lights are green. green. We will stay in S2 as long as there is a car waiting and the uh, long timer doesn't expire. If the long timer expires or there is a no car waiting, then they we will reset the timers and go to S3. S3 is farm road becomes yellow. That means short duration. Okay. So we will stay in S3 only until this short timer pulse doesn't expire. As soon as it expires, we will reset the start timer and go back to our default S0 state. You guys see that? Questions about this? As usual, once I have the state diagram, I can do the symbolic state transition table, encoded state transition table, K-map, build the circuit, blah, 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 all those steps. But the crucial aspect is assumptions that you list, unique states and inputs and outputs that you tabulate based on the problem statement for a particular FSM. But once you get to the state diagram, after that it's plug and chug. Over here, we have also introduced the idea that you could be moving from one state to the other based on expiration of certain timers. Mm, all right, so new, new questions coming in. I'm going to move to a combination lock. So yeah, this is um, not going to be very interesting combination lock, but it has a little bit more functionality compared to the uh, previous one that we did. Now, what is it? it? This is a combination lock in which there is a three bit serial lock that controls entry to a locked room. Three bit serial lock. 010 opens it. I don't know. 
one zero zero opens it. I don't know, but there is a three bit code to unlock a particular room. The inputs are reset, enter. There is a there are two position switches for e for bit uh, of key data, right? So imagine a switch that has two positions, right? And that position could be a zero, could be a one, right? So think of, when, when you think of this two position switch, uh, I want you guys to sort of picture uh, a, a, a slight switch. And there is only one of them, right? There are not three switches like this. There's just one switch like that. So essentially what the user is uh, trying to do is make the key right the make the make the input um, zero or one enter it make it change it or don't change it enter it again for the third time set it and then press enter then the fsm is supposed to take a look at the last three inputs that the user entered compare it with a code that was already set and then you can respond to either uh, do an unlock or there is an error light that gets eliminated if the key doesn't match the combination preset combination so what is the sequence of steps that are going to be typical you press reset initialize your fsm then you enter the key bit by using this particular switch low or high and then you press enter the user presses enter another switch and then you do this repeat two and three for two more times because it's a three bit serial lock you guys see that comfortable with the you know at least the problem statement Now, many of you are probably thinking, uh, worst case scenario, I need eight tries. Um, on an average, I need four tries. Sure. You can do that. <laughs> Easy to break the lock. Yes, that's right. Because, you know, do 000, then do 001 and so on. Uh, you are bound to open it uh, in one of the eight possibilities. And there's no alarm uh, output right now um, you know we are not calling the cops we are not setting off the the house alarm system nothing of that sort so it's again we are adding some new inputs and outputs but it's pretty easy to break in all right let's see what what is this incomplete uh, specification we have not talked about when does that error light get asserted? What do you think? When when should it get asserted? After the first bit that is entered, after the second bit that is entered, or after the third bit that is entered? After the third bit. Okay, so that's you know pretty straightforward, right? You would want the user to only know the result of their past three input bits. Uh, so don't show the error right away you would want to show the error light only after all the three bits have been entered all right so that's something that was not specified so that will go into your uh, list of assumptions uh, imagine if i told you it was wrong for each bit <laughs> yes all right so let's start making our assumptions Make reasonable assumptions. Error is asserted as soon as it is an error is detected or wait until the full combination. Obviously, you guys have uh, you are quick to realize that you, you your design should be such that error is asserted only after the full combination is asserted. Uh, full combination is, in, is entered by the user. Uh, this likely how depict hacking in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> So this could be sort of a, a, a short video, right, where uh, you could talk about how 
bad combination lock designers can signal uh, an error every uh, every input bit <laughs> all right we don't need to talk about why is it a bad idea to indicate an error immediately uh, because I'm sure you guys get that uh, let's see let's draw a block diagram of the lock we have a reset input to initialize our FS FSM we have this enter key we have this key in two position switch and there is a L0 L1 L2 preset internal combination by the user the owner or you know the person who is in charge of the room the output of this combination lock FSM is either going to be un to unlock the door or to illuminate the error LED so there are two outputs here unlock an error and there are number of inputs reset enter key in those are the three over here this is you know any user will use these three but there are also three other input bits that are um, set by the owner right? so that's an internal combination but that's also an input so next question what sequences should lead to opening the door what we are going to do is we are going to do error conditions on a second pass so it's sort of like how we d split up our finite state machine uh, state diagram into two paths remember for the uh, finite string recognizer we had one path for 010 we had another path for 100 right now over here because we are not signaling an error right away we still need to uh, we, we still need to allow the user to keep comparing inputs with the preset combination so as to give the user an the impression that they may or may not be correct right so you, you don't want to give it away which is why we are going to do error conditions on a second pass an alternate route you guys will uh, see more details about this and we will talk about that so let's let's take a look about this state diagram and i'll go through it from uh, start to finish when a user presses reset they will come into this start state they will stay in this start state if the user presses enter a uh, reset or the enter button is not pressed if the user presses the enter button and the reset button is not pressed you go to this new state called comparison zero so essentially we are comparing the first entered bit with the first bit in our internally set uh, combination that's comparison of the zeroth location if you will two things can happen one whatever the user has entered might be the same as the preset L0 or we might have uh, the wrong person trying to open it in which case the keyed in input bit may not be the same as L0 but because we need to keep this sort of thing hidden from the user we are going to respond to it by going to one of these two states both these states these are called idle zero and idle zero prime what are we doing there we are staying in this idle zero or idle zero prime for exactly the same amount of time what is that time it is the time for which the user doesn't enter doesn't press the enter button for the second time if the user presses the enter button for the second time having already positioned the switch they may or may not have changed the the, the originally uh, chosen uh, key this is now comparison for the next most significant position we are responding to that 
by either going to these steps or by going through these steps. Both of them are happening simultaneously. One is the good path and the other is the bad path. The only problem is that I have labeled them wrong. I have labeled the bad path in green and I have labeled the good path in red. That's the only problem here. Yeah. So this is what we are doing when the user is the right user, right? Equal, second bit is equal, third bit is equal, and then we unlock uh, over here. But if you are wrong here, or you may be wrong uh, here, or you may be wrong here. Every time you are wrong, you will come to this bad path. But even if you jump to the other path, your steps are the same. You will go to idle one and you will go to uh, uh, done in the good path, but you will uh, indicate error in the other path. But that only happens after all the three positions have been uh, identified. You guys see that? All right, so let's see. From idle zero, which is a state uh, for we, we are going to be there only for a short duration of time. It's not that it is being timed. It is just that the it is going to be controlled by the same uh, enter input. So the moment the user presses enter, we are going to go to this comparison one. We are also doing the comparison. Uh, so we are doing comparison one over here for the next most uh, uh, significant position for the second bit. It could be equal or you may go wrong. We do the last comparison here. You could be correct or you could be wrong. So there are paths for you to jump to the error, error path, the bad path at three different times. Comparison of L0, comparison of L1, comparison of L2. Every time you're wrong, you're going you're going to the to the to the other path here. However, you are not signaling error until you reach all the way to the end. So what are you doing in the meanwhile? Well, you are essentially faking to the user that you are sort of comparing bits and you are doing the idle one and so on. At the end, you could end up with the done state in which you unlock the door or you could end up in the error three state in which you signal an error. From this, you can press reset to go back to the start state. Questions about the state diagram of this particular combination lock. I can maybe say this is the good path and I can say this is the bad path. Questions here? Uh, don't include it and watch people who don't come to lecture. Beacon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, let's see. We move on to uh, this is going to be our last finite state machine design problem that we are going to look at. This is another combination lock but this is this has a, a lot of functionality but again this is not the best combination lock ever this but it does have uh, you know a way to to reset things uh, uh, an alarm state so so, so, so you know a, a bit more functionality than the previous ones so what is this combination lock supposed to do well there are two debounced push buttons, X and Y. 
those are functioning as our input the user will use x and y push buttons to enter a particular combination there is a particular sequence that will open the lock and that particular sequence that we are choosing for our combination lock is x x y x x so if a user goes in and pushes the buttons x x y x x so these are two push buttons so you have to do it in that particular order if you do that you open the lock that's feature number one feature number two we have press y three times in a row to reset the lock so anytime the user and of course the user who has uh, sort of purchased this lock and who is the owner of this lock knows this uh, code right so press three times maybe if you have uh, realized that you were accidentally entering the wrong sequence but you have realized it in the middle if you press y three times you can reset the lock the third feature is anytime the push button x is pressed out of sequence let me highlight that out of sequence when is when would it be out of sequence x is okay x is okay so if you press x for the third time that would be out of sequence for the first uh, for the first uh, attempt if x is pressed anytime out of sequence an output signal sets off the alarm to indicate that the long is uh, the lock is being tampered with so do anything but don't press x at the wrong time if you do you go to this alarm state fourth feature when the lock is open pressing either x or y will cause the lock to close without signaling an error so again the user is supposed to know i have op i have pressed it five times that is all i need don't press x or y for the sixth time if you do the lock will automatically close without signaling an error so these are four features that we have in this combination lock we are going to next state our assumptions. What does each state represent? Well, obviously, I need a state to capture five of the previous inputs, right? I need a good path in which I have x, x, y, x, x. Once I lay that out, then from that, I can branch off, right? From each state, how? what do I do if I get an x? What do I do if I get a y? And so on. Then I start building it up. I also need to include this three, press Y three times for reset situation and the alarm situation as well as the close situation. So I'm going to add more states to this. So let's take a look at how the finite state machine looks like. That's your answer. But I'm going to walk you guys through how the design choices have been made and what does each state mean and so on. So let's start talking about the good user first, right? So the good user is going to know, I need to press X, X, Y, X, X, and then you unlock. How does it start? Press a reset button to come to this first state, the initial state, S0. From S0, let us try to look at what happens when the user does it right, X, X, Y, X, X. In that case, you go through x, x, y, x, x. You will follow that path. You will eventually end up in S5 in which you will unlock. This is a melee finite state machine in which we are activating our outputs in, res in response to our inputs as well as the current state. So our outputs are denoted on the arrow. Let's talk about them. What are they? 
there are two outputs over here right the first bit alarm and unlock that's right the first one is corresponding to alarm followed by unlock so no alarm no unlock zero zero and as you can see when you go from s4 to s5 when you get that last x that's when you do not signal an alarm but you do unlock the combination lock that's the only time right during this path you see zero zero here zero zero here zero zero here zero zero here but it becomes zero one all the way at the end there so at this point i hope you guys see s0 down to s5 that particular path should be pretty straightforward right get x get x x get x x y get x x y x get x x y x x now we will start incorporating the other states for example if i how do i reset it well press y three times okay so let's see how it works with respect to s0 press y three times right once twice and three times so i've pressed y here y again y for the third time and i have reset my fsm while i was doing that from s0 didn't need to do an alarm didn't need to unlock so both outputs were zero and zero now let's take a look at so that's your this cycle here next i'm using this new state s6 as a state in which i get y for the first time that's the reason why i have a new state for that so i can use this even for going if you are in s1 that means you got x you could start resetting your fsm after entering x maybe the user was unsure about what they entered and they didn't want to deal with the alarm so they chose to reset it they can press y three times and reset it okay so if you are in s1 press y for the first time second time third time you go back to s0 similarly you can do that from all the other states as well right so suppose you are in s2 you can press y well from s2 you press y you go to s3 but you can press y again for the second time to go to s7 and then for the third time you get back to s0 from s4 the last input was x right so you would have to press y three times now first y you go to s6 second y you go to s7 third y go to s0 now so i hope you see what is the use of s6s and s7 you are using s6 to capture your first y you are using s7 to capture your second y press and you're using s0 to capture your third y press where you reset uh, what is the largest k-map we will have to do on the final? 4x4. Four 4x4 four. Four four for this, uh, for, for FSM, 4x4. Four four. Alright, let's talk about um, some other possibilities here. We have talked about S6, S7. We have talked about S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. Now let's talk about all the states in which we are going to create some panic for the bad user meaning we are going to have an alarm so when do you need to alarm well you sound an alarm when you press x in the wrong position at the wrong time what would that be like well if you press x for the first time okay for the second time okay for the third time if you press x that's a problem so x x if you press x for the third time you go to this other state s8 in which you will alarm don't unlock but alarm now you are in s8 
where there's an alarm going off. Now some bad users might think that I will just spam press X and I may get out. What happens then? Well, if you keep pressing X in a moment of panicking, you will stay in S8 and the alarm will keep going off while the while it doesn't get unlocked. However, so panic and spam Y. <laughs> yes, you can panic and spam Y. Uh, but you know, a, a, a user who knows this reset sequence of three Y's should be able to reset it. So they press Y for the first time, they end up in S9, still the alarm is going off. They press Y for the third, second time, there is an al alarm that is going off. And when they press Y for the third time, they go to S0 or outside this alarm situation. But while they are pressing the first two Y's, they still don't know whether, you know, they're they are on the right track or not. Now, we talked about what happens if you are in S8 and you press X. And we talked about what happens if you are in S8 and you press Y. Now, what happens if you are in S9 and you press X? Well, that would be an X out of position. So that would put you back into S8. What happens if you press X when you are in S10? Well, that would be X out of position, put you back in S8. Now, I think the last thing that we need to talk about is, uh, well, a couple of more transitions are left. If you were on this reset um, pattern, right? Like it's suppose the, the good user wanted to reset Y, Y, Y three times and you go back to S0. Okay, but what if a, a bad user is doing it? Maybe they, they think that Y, Y, X is the reset sequence. So they press Y here and then the second Y and then they press X. That is X out of position ends up in S8. From each state, you are looking at what should I do if I get an X? What should I do if I get an a, a Y? Right, so uh, you hit Y's as in Y, Y, Y. <laughs> Yep. Um, let's see. So you have got S5 as your unlocked situation. You have got S8, S9, S10 as your alarm states. Uh, if you are in S5, no matter what you press from here, if you press any button, you will go back to S0, which is what we said in our last assumption, right? We said, if, you, if the user doesn't know that it's a five, uh, five bit check, Maybe they think that it is six. Then whatever they press in S5, they actually lock it back again. So no, no alarm, but unlock. All right, so this particular melee finite state machine has uh, 11 states, right? So if you, if you have 11 states, uh, two inputs, two outputs, uh, you can probably start picturing how big the state is not the state, the, the encoded state transition table is going to be, right? So it's going to be a pretty uh, lengthy exercise for you to sort of uh, uh, do all the steps. So, you know, this is for the sake of, uh, you know, discussion and maybe something like this. If, if something like this size appears on the exam, it will not be for all the steps. It may be only for draw the state diagram list assumptions kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, that, that completes our discussion on finite state machine design. I'm going to stop recording and see if you guys have questions.